Okay, good evening um, and welcome to the public events program of the KTH School of Architecture. Happy to see so many of you here tonight. Um, tonight's uh, lecture is part of a sort of uh, little series that uh, we call Europe Endless. Um, it's uh, named after a Kraftwerk song, but we'll not go into that in detail. But in um, in December, we had a lecture by uh, Massimo Santanicia from uh, Reykjavik about how uh, different sort of forces affecting the urbanism of that city and urbanism in, uh, in Iceland in general. Um, tonight, we will talk about Istanbul and we'll come back uh, to this series later in the spring uh, with a talk about Tirana in Albania. Um, so, all of these cities are uh, European cities, um, but maybe share their, that they are very particular situations and particular contexts. And uh, hopefully, through the series as a whole, uh, we can sort of learn something about how to view Stockholm uh, through the eyes of uh, these other cities. Um, and Tonight we've invited Superpool or um, Selva Gurdigan and uh, uh, Gregor Stang Thompson uh, to uh, talk about uh, Istanbul. Uh, they are partners and founders of the office Superpool and uh, also directors or co-directors of uh, Studio X Istanbul. Uh, Columbia GSAP's uh, outpost in that city. So very happy to have you here tonight. And the floor is yours. Well, hello. Um, yeah, so we're both architects. I'm out of Denmark. I'm a, a eighth Swedish, actually, I just realized. <laughs> uh, but we've been in Istanbul for the last 10 years now. Uh, before that, we worked uh, together at OMA in Rotterdam and in New York. Uh, but uh, since 2006, we, we established Superpool in Istanbul that has been trying to figure out how to, let's say, be relevant in a, in a city of that size. Okay, so we just have that slide. Let's go back quickly. It's been running for a while, but uh, just to show, it's a very much a, a sea city. Let's say it's a Actually, in that way, it's kind of similar to Stockholm, I would imagine. It's uh, one of the cities that uses, I think, the most uh, water transportation as, as a means of commuting. Mm -hmm. uh, and it doesn't really have a center. As you can see, it kind of becomes a big mess uh, in how it operates. These are videos from uh, Foursquare chickens. Uh, so just, just to give you a little bit of a sense. Yeah, so not our work. Uh, but for those of you that have been to Istanbul, or even even if you haven't, but uh, Istanbul can be as picturesque as Stockholm, maybe. Um, but it can also be, let's say, as as simple uh, as this. Uh, but it's also brutal and, uh, let's say, roaring out there, uh, full on, uh, trying to, let's say, develop itself. Um, most of our work that we will share with you today is, though, happening in the in the context of this, let's say, this kind of urbanism. Uh, it's a self-grown unplanned city uh, where most of the, the population live today. Uh, we are uh, actually an architecture office, though this will be probably one of the few architecture projects we will show you because we will uh, show you more of the research uh, that we have done. Here is a basically was a competition for a, a school. Uh, I, I feel quite I difficult. Feel alone. <laughs> okay, I mean, it's, it's, it's an intimate crowd to have to, yeah. I think, to... <laughs> Yeah. Okay, short story is that uh, Sicily, as the image I showed before, is a, a very dense neighborhood. The, the very few green spaces that are left in this neighborhood is uh, cemeteries or courtyards of hospitals. Uh, and the competition was to build, tear this uh, building down, uh, which is a school, public school, build a new one. Uh, but it's also a typical Istanbul situation. You have a, a 20 meter drop from one end to the other of this site, uh, high rise on one side, um, you know, a lot of traffic going on on both sides, uh, so kind of intense moment. Uh, and 
what we want to explore in, in this particular project uh, was to, let's say, challenge the, the typical approach to how to build in this very uh, uh, topographic area. We carve out uh, big steps and build uh, blocks on top. Uh, why couldn't we just reinstate the, the, the landscape uh, since we already have a five-story building here when you talk about a 20-meter drop? Um, and kind of naively imagine that this school could also become a park from this for the city uh, when uh, when classes were over. So it could look uh, something like this. Uh, and the jury gave us a comment saying, we know, it, we know it is the future, but we're not there yet. And it's kind of emblematic for the city in a, even in a today and its early stage. Uh, since then, uh, we've done a number of exhibitions. So here for salt, uh, for salt. Uh, here for uh, another uh, art institution called Depo, uh, and even in Venice here for the uh, UAE Pavilion. Uh, last year, let's say it ended in the, let's say the most recent uh, exhibition design was for the Istanbul Design Biennial. Here the future is not what it used to be, uh, curated by Zoe Ryan out of Chicago. Uh, it took place here in the Greek school uh, school, an old school building that is not in function as a school any longer uh, and has been used as a cultural venue for the for some years by now. Uh, it's sort of an interesting building because obviously it was never meant as an ex exhibition space. So it has, when you come up the stairs, there's uh, two hallways and it's always, uh, when they used it in previous biennials, it was always a little bit confusing in terms of the curatorial kind of wayfinding, like how, where, where do you end up when you end up on that landing? Do you want to go to uh, the first little corridor or the uh, the big hall and the which rooms you know it it, w it didn't really kind of work uh, and then the building doesn't really have an elevator so the whole circulation you had to walk all the way up and these are really quite quite majestic stairs and then you see everything and when you w walk down then there's no surprises left anymore and then there was another opportunity with the stair because it had this uh, double um, double landings uh, double arms uh, so we thought it could be kind of interesting to actually chop the building in half. Uh, and so by by one half of the staircase you would go up and on the other half of the staircase you would come down and you would experience actually two halves of the building. So that looks like it's under construction, I'm going there. Um, well we're showing you these images just to, uh, yeah, basically this was the, this is the, it's a very majestic space where uh, the configurations happened uh, during the biennial. Um, um, and basically our design methodology is usually I, I, to build a lot of models, to go through many ideas, and at the end of conversations with the client and, uh, and ourselves, uh, kind of decide on, on something we, we think is the right solution. So here, here you see sort of the madness of that. Um, but in this project, I think the solution came from Portugal, actually. Yeah, so we were invited uh, to a cork producer in Portugal, uh, you might know them, it's, they're called Amarim, and they were interested in sponsoring this biennial. So we were curious to see how we could use the product. Their, their main business is, of course, cock stoppers. Uh, in the past, they used to uh, burn what was left when they used these cock stoppers, because they can only use 50% or less than 50% of the cork. Uh, and I said, you, in the past, they will burn them. But in, the, in a more uh, environmental uh, conscious age, of course, we need to use this cork for something, and it can be used for many things. One, uh, one, among uh, one thing, uh, among others, is insulation. Uh, but the, the opportunity came to use this cork uh, in the exhibition. So, in a way, we are just showing these as uh, as a background to explain our practice. That uh, yes, we are a practice that has been in Istanbul for ten years. Yes, we have done a lot of design work, um, and uh, most of them have has been. Uh, for cultural institutions, including the biennial. Uh, so now I think that part is kind of done and we go back to uh, Istanbul and the research that we do. Uh, in 2006, one of the first projects we did uh, was to do a Dolmuş Minibus map. Uh, partially it was because in, uh, I had been away also from Istanbul for seven years and Gregors was from Denmark. And when we landed in Istanbul in 2006, and imagine a period before iPhone, uh, Twitter, uh, Facebook, you know, kind of go back uh, a decade, uh, and to na to navigate, actually, you did need maps in some ways. But it was also sort of a joke. It was uh, something 
uh, that Gregors kept saying, why don't we make a bus map? And then we, we were saying, in, in, in kind of response to that, let's do something even more weird. Let's actually map these uh, minibuses, because they, they are actually not really for mapping. Yeah, and they work perfectly well without a map, right? You just ask the driver, I want to go here, how do I get there? And if it's not his bus, he will say, ah, go and, and take that other bus over there. Uh, so it's only for, for tourists who doesn't speak the local language, otherwise everyone else knows how to use the system. Uh, uh, but M Minibus is sort of an emblematic kind of invention of Istam Istanbul. Uh, if we go back one step and tell you uh, what they are, uh, they basically are um, just shared buses. They are privately owned. Uh, it's like a taxi, you get the, uh, the license plate. And then they're operated to run on designated routes, but the routes can vary depending on uh, how busy the streets are or if there's traffic jam, the guy can ask the passengers, does it matter if I go from there and everybody will say yes or no, and then he will kind of readjust the route. And uh, there is no set stops, so you can just say, you know, let me off in the next, uh, by the next tree and he will just let you off, or you can hop on whenever you, you catch one. So in, in some ways it was a either a kind of art project or a joke to, to do a map of these, uh, but, but we did it and it was a kind of for sale uh, at a luxurious um, gift store. Yeah. Uh, Shopping mall in, in a city. But it led to us uh, kind of an interest from, again, the, the, say the cultural uh, sector of the, of the city in, in helping them uh, mapping parts of Istanbul or aspects of Istanbul. So uh, GG, the parent gallery is now called Salt, uh, commissioned this book called Mapping Istanbul, uh, and the inter oh, sorry, and the intention was to uh, let's say figure out how Istanbul fitted fit into the puzzle of other mega cities. Uh, at that time, it was 2008. So uh, it's a book of 70 maps uh, at different scales. So this is Istanbul, how it's connected to the surrounding uh, world, uh, how Istanbul is connected to Turkey with buses out of Istanbul. Uh, when we zoom into Istanbul here, we look at uh, the age of the city. For those who don't know, uh, basically everything but this is from 1950 and onwards. Um, so S Istanbul is a, is a very old city, but also a very new city when we talk about the building stock. Right, so it in, in uh, at this time, the city was uh, one million people. Today is uh, the 15 million people who lives in a city who is that is only 70 years old. But for us, it was sort of site research. Uh, it was again we were new to the city. I was never an, we never had practiced. I, I had never looked at Istanbul through the eyes of an architect, also because I had I I didn't work there as an architect before this moment. So for us, it was also a learning uh, of how the city works and what are its uh, its pieces. So. But then, of course, the limit uh, of this, uh, it, the book was done for an art institution, so it was, I mean, we did give it to uh, some municipalities and whatnot too, but it, it was meant as kind of a, you know, it was printed only a thousand copies. It didn't really mean to reach a very wide audience. And it's one of the things that we learned, I think, as uh, we are keep doing research about the project, it became sl uh, about the city. For us, it became one of the problematics. So how do you communicate the research? So y you will see more examples of that uh, coming up. So again, this book was part of a larger uh, framework called uh, Becoming Istanbul. Uh, we happened also to then uh, design this exhibition when it finally came to Istanbul after first being in Frankfurt. Uh, it consisted partly also a, a browsable database that is still online called uh, becomingistanbul.org. Uh, there was a lecture space uh, where every day at six there was a talk. And there was a game space where uh, games took on, uh, one, let's say, at that time, important uh, topics of the city uh, in a, let's say, playful manner, even though it was for grown-ups. Uh, and we keep doing uh, maps. Uh, and part of the things we want to achieve is to be able to communicate, uh, let's say, beyond uh, architects. Uh, so instead of having a written column in this uh, monthly newspaper, uh, we submit a map. Uh, this is a map of all the uh, bigger parkers, parks in Istanbul and the uh, uh, public transportation that you can take to go to them. Uh, this next one is actually a, a possible bike routes. Istanbul is actually a very hilly city, so it's always assumed that it's too hilly to bike, uh, but we were 
um, at looking at the different inclinations of the streets to, dis to see if you could actually make a, a continuous route. And this became uh, actually a much serious study later uh, with that we did for the city. Yeah, so it turns out that 70% of Istanbul is bikeable when you just look at the, let's say, inclination of the city. The streets are probably not ready for it. Um, again, building on top of, let's say, research on top of research, Audi came in there to us and asked uh, through the Audi Urban Future Award um, project to, to look at Istanbul and what would mobility in Istanbul be in 2030. Um, we created a proposal that we called Park for them. And now we Park was a simple idea, so it was building up from the dolmuş or the minibus, basically the sh shared mobility. And to say uh, the more shared mobility you use, that you would gain points, and with the points you collect, you would get uh, sort of you could rent space in uh, in your street or in public space. Uh, this project is before Gezi Park. Uh, I, I need I feel like saying that because I, I think some of these issues were quite. Um, important for us and we were talking a lot about it uh, and uh, even though Audi was talking about uh, mobility, traffic and future, technology and so forth, what was important in our minds were more kind of community building, participation, democracy, like how do you actually um, talk about this, the politics of the space. So we had this kind of lofty uh, overstatement saying that uh, the future of democracy is in the streets where cars have freed up space for park um, and this is exactly one year before Gizi Park. So th let's say the urban conversation was not happening, let's say, in broader sense uh, among, let's say, everyday uh, citizens. Of course, Istanbul, I think, uh, has a major traffic pro problem. It, it does rank as the most congested city worldwide, I think, uh, at the moment, by at least ranked by TomTom, the big navigation company. Uh, but as a, a someone who lives in Istanbul, uh, we find the, let's say, the problems more on the small scale in the everyday life as you move around in the city, uh, or trying to. Uh, no one got hurt here, but this guy is doing something very stupid, and that is not walking on the street, uh, because that's, of course, easy, but to use the sidewalks is really, uh, uh, let's say, not easy, as you can see. The baby actually fell asleep during the shooting of this video at one moment. <laughs> so, but, w but why are the streets important, and, and how do we, let's say, why, what are we building on top of? Yeah, so uh, we wanted to also learn from the city again. So this, this idea of shared mobility, which is now, of course, quite um, co in, in conversation in everywhere. everywhere. We just, Gregors and I actually drove here with a car to go. Um, so, I mean, of course, shared mobility is now more ingrained in, our, um, in, the, in the contemporary conversation. But it's also something that existed in 1970s in Istanbul as well. And it still exists uh, in the form of these uh, yellow uh, domes or the minibus, um, which we can claim actually are uh, basically uh, car share. Uh, so car share companies like Zipcar uh, from, from the US, they claim that every shared car takes out 20 cars from streets. So if we imagine Istanbul with 20 times less cars, it's like really a, it would be a miracle city. So this was really our proposal to Audi get into <laughs> Which they are getting into, but uh, in other cities, <laughs> in some ways, I guess. Yeah. So that. Um, but why? Why was that important? Why? What do we gain by freeing up streets? Um, I think this in Istanbul, in, in a city like Istanbul, where it's uh, actually quite dense, uh, the streets become the main public space. It's where we celebrate. It's where we, you know, protest, take a break, eat, and kind of have domestic life outside. Um, etc. So streets are actually, uh, or your immediate outdoors uh, from your house or from your shop or whatever is, is your main basically uh, almost public um, space. And then again it's also important to talk about uh, democratic streets because this is uh, kind of uh, a healthy society also kind of is, you can see it from its uh, street life as well because we can all get together there. And it's not, we didn't invent this, this was talked a lot about in 1970s, Jane Jacobs being one of the kind of spareheads of this conversation in, the, in uh, New York. Uh, there is a lot written about uh, the democratic street and what it, it, what it is important that you don't see streets as a neutral space, but a space that you can actually occupy, change, interfere, interfere with. So again, back then, Istanbul was uh, the second largest Facebook in the city. And we are not here to say that Facebook is uh, great, but it uh, points at, or at least it tells you, 
that uh, Istanbul is a very young city, right? That people are very fast in, in picking up new technology. So for us, it was an indicator that we could actually propose a, a rather a kind of a software solution rather than maybe a build solution in this project. Uh, and why is software important? Yeah, so software is important because Turkey is trying to write its seventh constitution since uh, in uh, 1839. Uh, so every 20 years, we it's really kind of funny because the city is rebuilt more or less every 20, 30 years, and then the constitution is also rewritten. So we are at this moment of again negotiating both the city and the constitution. Uh, <laughs> so we, we thought it was also timely to to look at the software of, of the city. Um, this became an exhibition uh, also, uh, which. Then we had a kind of future uh, imagine it's kind of movies that represented for us future Taksim Square. Uh, yeah, Taksim Square at this point was almost gone. Uh, construction was to be uh, to begin any time basically. So this is uh, here will be a short movie showing how we thought this is. Park is an online platform for social interaction and mobility. It works like this: you gain points every time you choose to travel by intelligent domosh. With the points you collect, you get to rent space and organize events. Now let's take a look at how Elif is using Park. Elif wakes up and starts planning her day on Park. Elif looks at the many things happening in Beyoğlu today. She likes to live in Beyoğlu because there are many neighborhood events along with interesting institutional programs. Here is an invitation posted by Leila and Mehmet. Seems like their son Malik has learned how to ride a bike. Elif loves little Malik and would be happy to celebrate his achievement this evening. The event needs one more supporter for it to happen. She gladly accepts. The celebration will be on their street tonight. On her profile, Elif shares all the pictures taken at the events she has hosted. She can also keep track of how she is gaining and sharing her points. By mostly taking shared transportation, Elif has collected a lot of points and helped organize many community events. She especially likes engaging youngsters to help them learn fun things and make sure everybody cleans up after. She has gotten such good feedback that she is now on the run to becoming a neighborhood leader. Support Alif by attending one of her Robots for Kids workshops. And remember, with Park, you too can make a difference in your community. Okay, so um, yeah, we will come back to this uh, idea of uh, why why are we interested in social networks and and uh, in bringing them into a conversation of urban planning and design. Uh, another project of similar uh, tendency is an uh, uneven growth project. Again, we were invited to look at the future of Istanbul, um, which is kind of actually kind of funny once you start getting into being the team to look at the future of Istanbul. You get asked kind of from uh, Audi to MoMA to. Colombia, anyhow. So, but it, it, it's it's also s a s funny fascination that uh, I think the, the globally we are we have with these big cities. So Istanbul being one of the five um, Rio, New York, Mumbai, Hong Kong, Lagos uh, to to describe itself and its uh, future. Um. So the premise here was, uh, of course, um, as any everyone else, MoMA is seeing that, or well the curator team at MoMA, maybe not MoMA itself, but the curator there, uh, seeing that again repeating the same statistics we hear over and over again, that 50% of the uh, global pop population will live in cities, uh, but uh, most of those people will also be poor. So how can architects, let's say, say anything uh, clever in that context? But for us, the conversation about Istanbul was not necessarily about the slums or the Gece Kondo, as we call it in Istanbul, because that's kind of uh, 19 until 60s to 80s. That's what has happened. Uh, and after 80s onwards, most of those uh, land w was actually legalized and additional um, building rights were given. So the typical kind of um, building structure of I Istanbul is uh, post Gece Kondo, which is uh, what you see on the photo. But what is happening um, at the massive uh, 
rate is actually the mass housing from 1990s onwards. Uh, this is what this the city that is being built right now, uh, which is usually built through TOKI, which is the Housing Administration of Turkey, which is sort of the state en entity that uh, provides social housing. And it happens on a rel relatively massive scale. Uh, we were in some reviews earlier today saying, you know, Stockholm is also growing. Uh, Istanbul is definitely also still growing. Uh, and uh, let's say throughout Turkey, this model is replicated. So it's not only an Istanbul model, it's a, let's say, countrywide model of how to uh, accommodate or provide housing for and in a way, it's different. Uh, for the first time, actually, citizens themselves are not integrated into the building uh, process because the earlier both the Geje Kondu, which actually was all self-built, and the post Geje Kondu was usually self-developed. Uh, now you have these kind of um, really for 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 the first time, it's really top-down, and it's actually quite massive uh, scale of uh, construction that's happening. So we wanted to problematize this uh, because it's also being replicated. Uh, the same typology is being replicated by the uh, private sector. So it can be either a rich housing or poor housing, but it looks the same and it kind of offers the same lifestyle, more or less. And of course, uh, let's say if we talk um, uh, about the, the private sector version, it, it is targeting the predominantly growing middle class or emerging uh, middle class. Um, and the middle class, we, we didn't want to talk about the poor, but the middle class, because the middle class is actually the most vulner vulnerable uh, s section. Like that has w that is basically based on uh, data during the Spain, Greece, and Italian uh, crisis. The middle class got affected the most because it usually has less um, resilience because there's one job or every you know two jobs, and you, when you lose it, you don't have the capacity to kind of come up with other alternative ideas. So, uh, and then we could also foresee potentially a global ecological crisis, so th that makes even the idea of the middle class quite vulnerable and needed needing ad, um, to be addressed. Yeah. But since these housing developments are built really at mass, they're not going to go away. They will still be there. People will still be living there. Uh, so the, our proposal is here is how to make a counter movement to this uh, Toki development called Tito. Uh, so basically, trying to imagine how uh, we can develop these post-urban development corporations that uh, are allowed and, uh, let's say, possible to intervene in these areas that otherwise are also still very top-down managed. So this project was developed together with a, a um, Paris-based uh, team, AAA. Uh, 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 they are actually more kind of an activist group that uh, they, they do uh, projects with communities on the ground in suburbs of um, Paris. And I think it's interesting also to take in context of you are in a, a gallery where five million people pass through every day, uh, every year, and how do you communicate just a fraction of, an, let's say, urgent uh, piece of information in, in such a short time where people are really shopping through uh, and just ticking a box on, uh, I've been to MoMA, uh, so again, here we were trying to figure out how can we develop a language or a method to communicate with people. So, um, yeah. So our, our idea, again, basically, you'll see it through the video. Emre lives in Kayabashi, Block A, Flat 16, because it is much cheaper compared to the city center. This estate, built on an empty plot of land, is a long way away from the surprises of the big city. It is almost completely isolated from life, and to be frank, quite bored. Yet Emre was never a boring person. He was the unusual type in high school. Whenever he felt bored, he would come up with something fun, get involved in stuff, 
no one would expect him to. Sometimes fail, sometimes do good things, but always manage to impress the people around him. There was no doubt he had a different way of looking at the world. So it was again entirely out of boredom that Emre decided to plant tomatoes in the green plots in Kayabashi. This adventure, which began with a few tomatoes, in a short while turned into a digital application which enabled the free of charge sharing of tomatoes within the estate. That the tomatoes tasted delicious was one thing, but soon almost the entire estate had begun to use the application. Emre had once again managed to impress the people around him. Block B, flat 47, began to read books to kids in the evenings. The lentil soup of flat 63 became famous. Within a year, the desire of the residents of these few flats to share the services free of charge turned into a collective movement with much broader participation. Following a not-so-expensive infrastructure modification, the Kayabasha blocks reduced their water consumption by approximately 35%, and the total volume of waste produced by the estate by 40%. Estate residents took a collective risk, and without getting a permit from the municipality, opened shops along the demoralizing wall that surrounded the compound. And this collective act gave new meaning to the wall surrounding the estate and formed a new zone of living. The first shop to open belonged to Block A, Flat 19, and swiftly became both popular and successful. This was a colorful warehouse sharing stuff the children had grown out of. The adjacent shop of Block C, Flat 22, which mended small home appliances, used the barter method like all the other shops and was frequented by retired men. And it was exactly at this point that everything suddenly changed. A TV channel with high ratings broadcast a report on Kayabashi Estate, its wall of shops and its residents. It was immediately after the broadcast that the municipality, as a reward, installed solar panels that supplied the energy required for the wall and declared Kayabashi a model community. Within a short period of time, the wall of shops changed the way of life in Kayabashi. To stroll along the shops in the evening, to examine what was new to be shared, to take and to give, and to meet friends and new people and chat with them, became an attraction. This change, which began with the sharing of a tomato, was made possible because Emre was bored. We have only one request from Emre and those like him. Please get bored, always. So for us to, to imagine uh, basically how do we use these uh, okay, social media or other web platforms or online platforms to, to re-spark kind of the informality of, of Istanbul is a very important question. Uh, because Istanbul is a largely informal city that is now being very uh, kind of almost uh, straight jacketed into a very formal uh, typology of housing which doesn't actually have any any life around it at all so how do you uh, and and it, it doesn't have the tools of kind of a small scale kind of neighborhood relationships etc uh, as easily accommodated in in that new typology then how will can we use how can we imagine in a very naive way uh, the technology playing a new part in this and in some ways of course these these are just ideas uh, we didn't try to set this uh, application to work which in some ways we, we wish we could almost stop architecture and do that in some ways uh, but again it's um, um, even if we don't put them into life as a real time re real applications we think there is value in imagining technology from this naive perspective because right now a lot of people are investing a lot of energy into de developing so software, but they're usually investing it with a kind of with an idea of um, of uh, economic um, gain because there's also a lot of money to be made. So this naive perspective about technology, city, uh, social networks, we think is kind of valuable to to cherish because uh, there is a very also strong, not so naive um, uh, kind of impulse. 
Yes, it goes under the name Smart City, yes. <laughs> so smart construction. Sorry. Basically, uh, trying to imagine and, and let's say improve the, the building with concrete, so mm -hmm. we can let's say get a step further away from the precast, repetitive uh, implementation of let's say housing, uh, and let's say have easier access to the freedom of what this liquid stone really is. Um, but of course, it comes at a high cost, at least at the moment, right? I mean, it's very easy, uh, efficient, fast to 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 do the precast. Uh, if you want to do more, let's say, imaginative architecture with concrete, it becomes very complex and costly. Uh, so the premise of this project is looking into how can we, industri how can we industrialize this process a bit uh, to make it, uh, let's say, more affordable and accessible. So w when you, w and uh, we were, this is actually a research project with 14 partners, uh, including uh, actually from the Sweden, Ah, Chalmers was partner uh, as a structural engineering, let's say, capacity. Um, but also a, a whole range of other engineering uh, and, uh, and researching uh, entities. So when you look at, uh, the for example, a blog like the Zine, where uh, a lot of unbuilt projects are uh, posted, you see half of the projects have complex geometries. Uh, but, uh, but when you look at something like uh, Arc Daily, where it's mostly built projects, you see that there's only maybe 15% of them or 18% that have complex geometry. So there is definitely a desire, as, as we all know, for complexity in geometry. And it uh, it can be as kind of uh, maybe as uh, self-indulgent uh, as these images or, or, or not. But uh, it's also, we can also say there is a, a lot of intelligence in complex, complex shapes uh, that we are also learning to rediscover uh, with performance uh, evaluating capacity that we have now through software again. So of course the project traps into this uh, old old story of uh, Fire's refractory also uh, in architecture. Um, so let's say invention were, were made in the project to uh, to let's say improve the process. So one one thing would, was a software plugin uh, developed together with ETH uh, that can analyze a, a any given shape and tell you whether it's buildable or not. So where we have red dots right now here, this shape is not buildable with a let's say already plugged in. Uh, formwork system, uh, so that means you can already here modify your your shape, uh, so you don't need to go all the way to to the uh, bid process and the contractor calls comes back and tell you I can't build this. Uh, so we could streamline the process uh, a bit. Um, one of the main constraints is the formwork, as we saw in the beginning. Uh, usually, uh, of up to seventy five percent of the cost of formwork uh, or of the let's say pouring of the concrete goes into the formwork. Uh, so uh, we need to find methods of reusing the formwork in some format. Uh, one uh, method is to use wax, uh, pour it into a digital mold, and then you use the wax as a as the molding material. It can then be re-melded um, and reused or reused as they are. Or the current state-of-the-art uh, method is milling into styrofoam. Uh, of course, also not very good if you can't reuse the, the styrofoam, which you can if it's clean. So methods were developed to keep it clean in, in during the casting process. Um, concrete needs to be uh, of a different mixture, uh, so teams in, in Copenhagen were working on that. And together with the robot uh, experts also in the team, um, methods were, to build were made to build uh, uh, reinforcement meshes that was, uh, let's say, 3D uh, in assembled in 3D already from, from factory side. So this V-bar bent in three dimension, now only the robot knows how to place correctly. Uh, and it can bind and uh, put these meshes ready and we can bring them to the site to put them into the formwork. So a prototype was designed incorporating all the elements that we needed to prove was, was been uh, uh, achieved. Uh, and finally a prototype was built up in Aarhus this formwork contractor's site, unfortunately only. Uh, it's the most jumpy, uh, <laughs> anyhow. So this was the final prototype. Uh, it is a proof of concept and obviously not perfect, uh, but it at least managed to show that building with concrete 
when we are talking about preform uh, uh, shapes can also be industrialized. So we, it doesn't need to be these one-off uh, unique shapes that only projects of uh, Zaha Deed can afford. Yeah, so uh, going back to basically we where we are at now, um, we have we have applied to new kind of uh, projects similar to TaylorCrete, uh, and those are quite long processes actually to, to do the application, it usually takes uh, 6 to 12 months and so forth. So hopefully the office will keep uh, going in that direction because we find it quite interesting. Uh, of course the office will also go into uh, still research um, at the city level, uh, but recently we were invited to uh, do uh, mapping Istanbul again in, uh, in Rome. And at that moment, actually, we had sort of a, a little bit of, uh, let's say, um, self-reflection moment. So we will show you two short, we prepared three short movies, but we will show you clips from two. Um, the, the idea was to look at the last um, seven, six years, basically. Mapping Istanbul was done in 2008. Even though the stock market crash in 2008 marked the beginning of global economic downturn, while mapping Istanbul was put together, Turkey was on the cusp of a period of growth. In 2015, it is difficult to imagine mapping Istanbul without a global debt map. So this is actually uh, the nicest part of this movie because the rest of it actually talks about wars and uh, uh, the refugee crisis and etc. So we didn't want to kind of end with that note, but we, we started thinking uh, um, of when we started in 2006, uh, the kind of the happy moment where you start your own office and you want to learn about your city and so forth, and you put together a book. And in that book, actually, now we're s ourselves very surprised there is nothing political in it. Um, and then, s you know, the, the most political thing is uh, education map. Um, so uh, this exhibition in Rome became kind of an uh, interesting moment to do that reflection. Uh, we will show in you most of the Istanbul movie. It is difficult to imagine mapping Istanbul without the Gezi Park protest and the yet unfulfilled desire for having a voice in urban politics. When Gezi Park protest started on May 28, 2013, it was happening against the backdrop of a multitude of mega projects. The Marmaray Tunnel was completed on September 23, 2008 though trains would start service later in October 2013. February 26, 2011 marked the groundbreaking for the Eurasia Tunnel. In April 2012, Maltepe landfill started, along with the Yenikapu landfill a year later in April 2013. On May 3, 2013, 22,152 billion euro tender for the third airport was awarded followed by the Galata Port tender on May 16, 2013. As the protests in the park were raging on May 29, 2013, officials were celebrating the groundbreaking for the third bridge. The Halic Port tender was to be awarded a couple months later on July 24, 2013. Today, it is difficult to map Istanbul. There is no mathematical way to foresee the effects of large infrastructure projects like Marmaray, the Eurasian Tunnel, the Third Bridge and the Third Airport. There is also no statistical way to demonstrate how the energy of Gezi Park protest dissipated. It can only be presumed that it kindled the imagination of a new generation of citizens. So, um, just, uh, I guess, to, to take you where we are um, in terms of our thinking about the city. Um, but we will take, talk about w how, where we can take action, let's say. Um, so, Studio X Istanbul, in that sense, has been quite an interesting um, experiment for us. Um, because we've been thinking and kind of uh, envisioning ideas for the city. Uh, and now with the Columbia University's um, outpost in Istanbul, which is called Studio X, uh, we have a playground to actually invite more people to, to have a conversation and to, to kind of uh, challenge them to 
to think critically about the city and uh, to encourage them to kind of foster conversations, etc. So it's a very um, exciting project for us. This is before the opening of the space, uh, which is on the main street. It's right across from Istanbul Modern, more or less. Uh, so it's uh, in, in the heart of town, uh, though not a very pedestrian uh, location. So we don't get thousands of people pouring. So it's actually quite an intimate space. And while we were rearranging chairs with uh, Bjorn today, we, we talked about how many times we re also rearranged chairs at Studio X. So that's kind of a part of this uh, life of a kind of flexible space um, that is for conversation. Um, so, Studio X's are um, across the world in many places. Uh, it is Columbia University's uh, kind of attempt uh, or its, its vision of how to become a global university. So, we meet uh, once, twice a year uh, in New York. Uh, this is all the directors and the dean. Uh, but let's say, it's, I mean, it's the architecture school's vision of being global. It's not the university at large. Uh, I mean yeah, there's uh, two different visions. Yeah, yeah. So we are very intimately uh, related to the architecture department. And the, the project was initiated by the previous dean, Mark Wigley, uh, as his kind of grandchild of exactly how, how, can, how, can we, how can architects, and how can he, in particular, when they're sitting on Manhattan, how can they be, uh, let's say, uh, subjected to a, what he calls a stupidity reduction machine? Like, how can we know more? Uh, and the only way to know more is to be where the change is happening. Yes, in, in that sense, um, I think the model is quite interesting. Uh, Columbia, uh, s or GSAP, uh, the architecture school at Columbia, um, has thought of not uh, opening a branch, uh, but instead to open a kind of a platform for conversation. And we, we are hosted by a, we have a sponsor for the space, uh, but Columbia is also actually itself uh, supporting the space uh, uh, financially. So, but then whatever we do in the space is actually really um, up to us uh, to, to and Col Colombia or GSAP is only w one of the participants in, in the conversations that is happening at StudioXs. And they're very local conversations, uh, but we do them being aware that we are talking to uh, the world at large because we're talking essentially also to Colombia. So the spaces are, um, all of them are quite um, sort of flexible. So one day it could be a book gallery. We do have exhibitions. Yeah, there's a lot of lectures, etc. in the spaces. This is from the opening night. I think uh, it was definitely a, a needed space uh, to. Um, this is also actually let if we if we do use Gezi Park again. I, this is six months after the Gezi Park protests, uh, so it I think was also quite timely. Uh, after that, energy uh, erupted. Let's say um, to to have an academic space that actually was ready to 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 take it to another level. So uh, we do exhibitions. This is one of the first exhibitions we did called Cemetery of Architects together with an um, artist uh, where we, if we said if we want to talk about the f future of the city, we need to talk about its past as well. And Istanbul actually in the last hundred years is a, a quite, um, there's a lot of suppressed stro stories that need to be kind of uh, discovered and talked about. So these are all the architects that were practici practicing at the end of the Ottoman Empire. Oh, let's say some of them. I, I mean, uh, yeah, these uh, these are the names of all uh, architects, yeah. Uh, this is the la la latest exhibition we had in the space, which we um, we just closed last Friday, um, about uh, um, landscape practice. Um, we also publish books, um, and then we do a lot of things with children as well. So it is actually very much like this space in, in some ways, uh, where one day, uh, there's a review and then in the evening there's a lecture and there's a party outside. So all of those things can uh, happen together. Except it's not on the university's own campus, it's actually somewhere else. Uh, which I think is a great experiment that uh, Colombia has undertaken. So we started with the school and now we'll also end with the school. Uh, so just to give you next step, we're working on this uh, decommissioned factory to turn it into a university building on Northern Cyprus. Uh, we will get back to you in half a year uh, to how uh, that happened. So uh, for us, this is kind of one of the more serious architecture projects that uh, Superpool is undertaking. Uh, we're quite excited to go from here to Cyprus almost. Uh, uh, we will be there on Sunday. 
to, to see it through. So thank you, thank you for listening to us, and we would be very happy to answer questions. Uh, thanks so much for your presentation. Um, a few years ago, I took part in screening um, this movie that I'm sure you've heard about, The uh, Endless City, uh, Ecumenopolis. Yeah? And we had the director and the producer here. And um, basically, just sort of uh, documenting the, the violence of, of evictions, the, the absolutely sort of planless plans inserted on the, the, the third bridge and uh, Istanbul developing towards ecological disaster. And, and that was before the Gezi Park movement or protests. And then, uh, f you know, since that, it's, you know, so much has happened, which is really so concerning. So um, I was just wondering if you could ex say something more about how you see your own practice in relationship to these really worrying um, development in, in, in Turkey, but in Istanbul, uh, in terms of um, uh, control of, of the internet, control of uh, how spaces are used, and, and, and so on, these things we read about in the news. I mean, how you sort of balance your own activities in view of this, um, in fact, sort of totalitarian development that we're witnessing. A big question, but it, I really Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, we, we actually were, um wondering if we should show you the full uh, mapping Istanbul in 2015 movies or not earlier in the day and we thought the the tone of it would not be so um, maybe uplifting so we we s just chose those two parts but in in some ways of course what uh, what you read is uh, let's say maybe 10 times worse than what it is in some ways yeah or and uh, what what you feel as a concerned person is probably uh, again a lot more sharp than um, than uh, just the everyday um, or just anyone else who is not so concerned about urban politics what what we feel is probably a lot sharper and a lot deeper than uh, what is the general sentiment um, so how do we balance and how do we deal with it I think um, these days it's it's difficult um, I I'll be honest it's it's difficult um, because of the bombings in Ankara the other day and, and the general sort of um, security concerns in the city of Istanbul today and tomorrow and over the weekend. Um, but it is, let's say it's not, it's a, it is something that mm, the Middle East and Syria has dealt with five years and it's uh, only fair, I guess, to have a w weekend of anxiety where so many other people have had so many years of anxiety by now. Um, so that that is, in terms of the war that is in the region, I, I'm st I cannot say anything. Um, and in terms of the totalitarian politics, politics is always, it's, it's slimy territory. Um, one person's propaganda is another person's lie, is another person's propaganda is another person's. I, it's just so difficult anymore. For the last three years, it has been um, consecutive elections. So what is not propaganda is not clear anymore. Everything but reads and feels like propaganda. So at that moment, you don't really know what is reality but anymore. But, but the scale of uh, what's going on with the kind of reconstruction and uh, demolishment of the city, like Talabashi, for instance. Right. Well, and yeah. So there's really concrete effects. And whenever I go back to Istanbul, a new building has disappeared. And it's changing very, very quickly. Um, indeed, uh, but there is also there is also s small good news like the Gezi Park. Here. There is also small good news like uh, Haidar Pasha not becoming a hotel. Um, I mean, uh, you know, if you want to lose hope, you can lose hope. And I don't know, we cannot move to the states either anymore. So if Trump gets uh, elected there, then we should just go to Mars. Uh, but so, uh, you know, in some ways, you you need to also function, um, and in that sense. This morning, Gregor's told me to function, and uh, we we decided not to show you the full mapping Istanbul uh, movies. But I mean, in terms of our own practice, you, uh, let's say we are not part of the let's say large-scale urban development. Meaning, we don't work for, or so far haven't worked for, let's say big developers, right? That does. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, as as an office, right? We try to have, let's say. 
standards in terms of what kind of projects we engage in. Uh, and that's, I guess, as much as you can do as a firm, right? You, you can denounce or don't do the projects that you think are, think are not right for the city. Um, to, to change the, the, whatever the, let's say, the momentum of what's happening in the city as, you know, a 10-person office is, you know, beyond our capacity. And the only thing we can do is, to, is show a relatively naive movie in MoMA, right? And God knows what kind of effect that would have. Um, so, I mean, uh, sometimes, of course, you feel also relatively desperate. Uh, I would like to ask a question, but uh, first of all, thank you for the lecture. It was great um, in different ways. Um, I wanted to ask about that. You mentioned about those big constructions that were preceding the big political events, as I understood, like the tunnel, the airport, the, the bridge. And uh, do you think they affected it in, a, in an economical way that sort of such a giant amount of money were sort of manipulated around? Or it was a real infrastructural effect that people fr from across the bus world could easier come to the city in a way? Um, just, yeah. If you understand yeah, the yeah, question. Yeah, it, yeah, I mean, uh, I guess you can, I'm sure the municipality and the government will have very convincing arguments why that uh, airport should be there and the bridge should be there. Um, and I'm sure we can make equally convincing arguments why they shouldn't be. Uh, but whenever we talk about this, uh, also, construction sector is, uh, is the engine of uh, Turkish economy right now. Um, so and we do export construction to different parts of the world. Um, so there is a desire to keep the machine running. It's, uh, it's not sustainable. It, it has happened in Gre um, Spain, and it has crashed them. Uh, so, I mean, there, there is a lot of so, yeah, warnings that you can say it's not sustainable and it will end up in a crash. But right now, yes, it is a big uh, money-making um, machine that is better to keep it running than, than not. But at the same time, the city needs improvement in, in its infrastructure, right? So yes, a tunnel for trains were definitely desperately needed onto the Bosporus. Uh, yeah, whether there should be more bridges over the, the Bosporus, you can say, well, in Manhattan, there is, I don't know how many bridges going to and from Manhattan, right? So why not another bridge? It's the location, right? The way it's done, right? Uh, that is maybe questionable, right? But in a, in a 15, 20 million city, you need infrastructure. and usually comes from top down. Um, there's no easy way to do a bottom up infrastructure project except yeah. So but it can be done more careful and we, we don't we I mean I wouldn't sign my name under any of those projects and we, we did we really did decline being a part of the airport project. Uh, so thank you. Any further questions? Uh, I could uh, mention that this uh, video that you're mentioning uh, is available on your uh, Vimeo site, I think, so you can look it up uh, <laughs> online. <laughs> and it, and, I and I just wanted to to comment that I think it's a really interesting take on sort of revising your own work. I mean, it's in this sort of. Uh, um I mean, you can do it in, in many ways, and this is uh, quite a charming one, but also sort of realizing that what you said at one point is no longer valid and sort of overlay it with the context of of the current moment is, I think, a great sort of uh, um, learning experience, I guess, for you and for anyone who sort of puts something out at a given time. Um, how How did you sort of... Was that uh, inevitable, or did you just look at the book in your own library and think? Uh, we yeah. were invited to exhibit it, uh, at, and then we thought we can't. I mean, this is just so old by now, and all of the, like the the hap that was a very particular moment, 2007, 2008, uh, because it, it everything was very positive, everything was very optimistic. You, you know, it was it was a very particular moment, and then also in the world, I think. Uh, you know, Occupy wasn't Occupy movement didn't happen. The uh, the stock exchanges didn't crash. I mean, it's like so many things has happened in the last six years that when we started thinking about how do you update that book, we we were like, you don't update that book because there's so much that has happened that has 
is, is you cannot just capture it with mapping anymore in, in some way. Or yes, you can. I mean, of course, it's a provocation. Yes, of course, you can capture it with mapping also. But that uh, the issues are much much deeper and much much more complex. Yeah, thank you for your great talk, and I totally apologize for being so late. So uh, maybe you already explained what I would like to ask. I mean, I was uh, quite uh, impressed by what you answered to Katerina's question, because I can imagine that the situation has become really difficult now. So I wondered how, uh, which ways do you actually have of problematizing uh, these uh, investments, uh, the the uh, disappearing uh, Geche Kondo and these things. So, so which ways do you actually have uh, to raise uh, your voice without uh, bringing yourself in a very dangerous role, maybe? I mean, you know what I mean? Because you said yeah, you like to have to function, okay, but, but, but how open can you be about that and where? No, I mean, we're, I don't think we are censoring ourselves uh, and we do criticize. And as you see through other, let's say, media channels, um, but maybe they don't make it home, let's say, right, whatever we present at that moment yeah. in New York, um, maybe doesn't find it very reasonable, I don't know. It's difficult to see. So. Well, I think our main kind of uh, front line for resistance is actually Studio X. Uh, I, you know, I, I wouldn't, in, in some ways, um, I mean, I, I don't want to use uh, such military kind of vocabulary to say frontline resistance is, is not it's not that actually it's, it's of course just a academic space for conversation but uh, I think it is the the only way is is to move forward and I think when you think about um, again it's it's a very long conversation yeah like uh, the last hundred years of Istanbul is there's a lot of issues that need to be looked at I mean the uh, for for Europe, it's the Second World War that needs to be looked at. For Turkey, it's the uh, First World War that needs to be discussed. And it has never really been kind of discussed what what has happened in that region um, and what has happened in the aftermath. Uh, so there's a there's a lot of reconciliation in the different t narratives of history, and we are seeing that right now uh, in in a very uh, in a very bloody and uh, unpleasant way. Um, but yeah, there's nothing. Uh, as an architecture practice, yes. Because architecture, of course, always is a very positive act, right? Or it, is, it has to have an optimistic position of future. We're always imagining future. We're always designing for the future, this building, that house that uh, this person will live in. We renovate. We kind of, we, we're always very future oriented. And maybe that's a good thing um, because, you know, because uh, someone needs to think uh, about uh, about the next step as well. I mean, but there there is, we could talk for hours on this. Um, I mean, we, we did an exhibition called Architecture of Peace in, in Studio X, together with Arkis uh, from Netherlands. Uh, and of course, you could build for peace or you could build for war, even if you intend to build for peace. Um, yeah, I mean, all, all of these things are, um, yeah, you, I think as an architect, to be self-critical is, is the most important virtue. Um, and we had that conversation earlier in a, uh, in a review today. Um, and I think in that sense, schools, uh, studio exits, et cetera, uh, every place where it opens discussion about being critical of the profession, of, of the work, of the research, et cetera, is, is the only really valuable thing we can do. Thank you. Question over here. Thank you for your presentation. And uh, as we discussed before, I, I was in Istanbul like 2012, no? So it was briefly before, the, or it was actually the day when um, uh, Gezi Park, um, the day before Gezi Park became like um, um, stormed, kind of. And uh, I was wondering if there um, was a major change also in the perception of the public of the right to the to green, like the right to the park, because basically we were really shocked that there is the this is the only park really in the whole large area of the old town. I mean, there is the border of, but I, I mean compared yet now to cities uh, like Stockholm or I don't know. I'm I've lived in Graz this time, so I don't know. It's a kind of 
And then we've, we've discussed a lot about the forest, actually, the Belgrade forest, and the role of this um, forest to, to the city, which is kind of blocked officially. I mean, it, there are some only some entrances, but it's not like an European forest that you can enter anywhere. So I was wondering if there was a major shift that you could also detect in this kind of eco ecological disasters that are happening. Now, uh, again, we see it also from Studio X uh, that whenever we do a kind of uh, exhibition that has uh, either artists uh, involved and it talks about the city in a kind of political way, we always make it into the newspaper. So, uh, I mean, we, we, we know that now there's an audience, uh, that there, there, is an ex there is a conversation. So that's, that's the good thing. Um, but we, we will see where it will go. And there's also a lot of small initiatives uh, but we also see where we need to see where that goes. I mean, it's it's just like really like in the end of that movie. No, you just need to cast your uh, coffee uh <laughs> fortune telling moment, and uh, it's it's really like that right now. Uh, we can we can tell a lot of for fortunes. Hopefully, the good ones will happen. Any further questions or comments? But well, one last thing, um, think, I mean, of course, Istanbul in your endless uh, Europe series will probably be the most dramatic city, potentially. Uh, but think about it, in, um, I mean, we also always like to underline that it's in some ways quite normal city. I mean, there is, uh, if you compare it to other cities of its size, it's 15 to 20 million people, yeah, so it's, it's actually, it, it's a big deal, no? Like, that, that size of city is, um, is a big deal. Um, in, and in that sense, it is, you know, it does have a relatively well-functioning public sy transport system. Yes, I mean, there's, you could always talk a lot about downsides, uh, but you could also see it as a kind of medium, well-behaved city. This doesn't really have crime. Yes, there's a security issue today, but I mean, it, you could also say it's actually quite a well-behaved city for a 15 million monster. Yeah, I mean, when we look at the other cities, I, I think that's still or Mumbai, you know, you can easily, you would find Istanbul as a, let's say, a European city in many ways, right? So uh, you don't feel, or I don't feel as, uh, let's say, a big uh, threat when I walk in the streets of Istanbul. <laughs> but it doesn't mean that there's not, I mean, obviously there is uh, issues to work on. Thank you so much, uh, Selva and Gregish.